Okay, um, I think we should start. Um, I'm very pleased in this series that we're doing uh, to welcome Doreen Banath, uh, who's going to talk this evening uh, about curves. Um, Doreen was trained uh, as an architect uh, at Cambridge and was then trained as an intellectual at the AA. Normally it's the other way around. <laughs> um, so you'll see the results uh, this evening. But she came to the AA to do uh, a PhD with me. And I think it's fair to say that it was one of the most interesting PhDs and in a way successful PhDs uh, that I've ever supervised. It's not, to my knowledge, published yet, though I'm sure it will be. Um, but I guess there's a copy in the library. Uh, I do encourage anyone uh, to read it because it raises very kind of elementary questions about the current nature of architectural practice and its relation to architect for techniques of architectural representation. Um, and she accomplishes this in an extremely novel and interesting way. She had the good fortune when here to to have one of the sought after Reba scholarships. Uh, and since then, uh, the thesis after it was examined um, was shortlisted uh, for the Reba Gold Medal. Um, I'm not sure we can yet identify the idiot who got it. <laughs> but uh, I'm told there's no appeal. Uh, but she was fortunate to have the scholarship, uh, as is now sitting another of our teachers uh, here who also uh, has it, um, Ross Adams, who's teaching in the history and theory. Uh, I'm sure that you'll see some of the argument in the paper. Uh, but let me really recommend the thesis as a very strong and original work. Okay, thank you very much, and I'd like to introduce you to Doreen. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, <laughs> and always as generous as ever. Um, I'm very happy to be back in, at the AA um, to give this little talk. This is an ongoing paper, and um, so it's going to read like a collage of many ideas. And parts of it, and I dare say a small part of it, sprang from the thesis um, when we were discussing with Mark a lot about the transition um, of representational, representational form and the influence of technique um, on design imagination and also the uh, theory that explains how we work. And, um, and also part of my thesis addresses uh, cross-cultural issues. I was looking at um, how architects and intellectuals, let's say, in, in the Chinese-speaking culture, how they address the whole kind of um, concept of architecture as, as something which originated in the Western intellectual sphere and has a long history and a very um, uh, strong structure and how in a cross-cultural context, how they, how they address it. And um, one of the things that I, I, it's intrigued me for, for years is um, it just simple things about lines. And perhaps I grew up in a culture where you draw, basically it's like a pictogram, you draw Chinese characters. So you, you're sitting in class, you repeat all the strokes. So perhaps that, that kind of creates a curiosity for me to look at how architects or even you know, artists are in a, in a bigger design way, how they use lines, and what does that mean to use lines. And, um, and part of the thesis uh, went back to look at the dichotomy of the projective and the pictorial, which was a very strong, as, as we discover working with Mark. 
um, very, very strongly embedded in the way we justify and reason our design. And, um, and there's, there's been mega shifts across, um, which has been shifted also momentously by the technical changes. So shifting from um, um, manual and also all sets of tools that gives you straight lines and measurable lines and projective lines and perspectival lines. And then now you have um, the digital that's doing that for you. There's this, this is the uh, confirmation of the, um, of the technology. But then also, the digital is also taking us to another way of making lines, which may start it off as very straightforwardly as straight lines. But then they turn into something else. So it's kind of um, sort of crisscrossing many things um, in, in this paper, which I'm looking at the nature of the lines as curves. And, and actually, from the beginning to the end of this talk, even the word curve is going to start to, to change. Maybe we don't even use the word curve anymore to describe the line we're making or generating because it's no longer, no longer adequate, or perhaps its meaning has to be redefined. And, um, and so, yeah, and I, I like to start. So this is kind of a, this is kind of glossary of, of what I will go through, but not necessarily in this order and not necessarily very logical <laughs> in, in its layout, but I'm touching on the word cu curves, not just as a physical line. Maybe it's, it's an illusionistic line. Maybe it's a representational notion. Maybe, maybe it's a motion. Maybe it's, it's some kind of um, emergence and growth in, in the later kind of more recent theories. And, um, and I'd like to, to start with a little anecdote um, from, I was just reading an, an article recently, it's Adorno writing about Richard Strauss. He's writing about music. And, um, and then there's this quote that happened in the article about him using the word curve to describe Richard Strauss's music. And uh, the, the idea of Elan itself, music as curve, implies a fall from the heights. And was thrown by a composing hand must sing abruptly in meteor, uh, meteoric arc. And this, um, this imagination is linking the curve to something that coming from the will of the person leaping off, but it's also implying in disintegration. This in this uh, this sorry. <laughs> um, so unity realizes itself in disintegration, and the language of music no longer able to to sustain coherent meaning. So this is a big point on Adorno's piece and on his purposeful use of the word curve. And uh, in a funny way, it's a curve that's made from a leap, from height. It's a curve that takes you to a certain death or a certain disintegration in that way. And um, if you go back, the, uh, the second sentence about the decline, because at the end, you discover Adorno really, really doesn't like the way Richard Strauss, he's, he's appalled by the kind of um, the direction that the music is being, being structured. And, um, and he, he feels that there's something that's leaping into disintegration, leaping into death. And this is about the same time in, in the 60s where Yves Klein made this collage about himself leaping into the void and the use, the use of the word void in this case is being somehow metaphorically linked to the leap and to the curve, the curve that leads you into the death of the void. So, and I, I, this is like starting off, this, this will, we, we can come back to at the end of the talk to say, perhaps there's a certain curve that's, that's already reaching its death, that's, that's already at the end. There are certain notions that's no longer um, relevant to, to, to the way we work. So, um, so going back, and going back quite a, quite a lot to a few centuries ago. So um, Da Vinci was writing about perspective, and there's um, a very important thing which Da Vinci was pointing out when he was writing about perspective. He was, in some ways, very much in the same game as Alberti and, and Brunelleschi, looking at how lines construct visions from the pupils into the object. But at the same time, he also says perspective is not just about form. Perspective is only also about color. There's a perspective of color, and there's also a perspective of substance. And from Leonardo da Vinci's point of view, the image of um, substance is more powerful than the image of color, 
and the image of color is more powerful than the image of form. And altogether, all these images all, all only integrates itself when it reaches the pupil of the observer. And um, so a lot of the discourses on perspective um, is gradually missing out the fact that even color and substance and bodies and flesh um, is also part of, it should be part of the, the, the way we perceive and the way perspective should work. And um, the notion of normal surface, curve is one of the things, so lines, curves, surfaces, uh, mass, and um, <coughs> even to the extent of nowadays, you have vector graphics and raster graphic. And vector graphics is a direct kind of, um, of um, link to the way perspective, projective perspective is set up. Because vector graphics is based on vectors, and vectors have no substance. The vector is a mathematical formula that directs the movement of, of a point from A to B. And whatever is in between is of no consequence. It's only the two, two, um, two points and the motion in between. And by contrast, when you talk about raster graphics, it's something that's via pixels. So every single point along that line has to be recorded and it has to take on substance. And therefore takes on color, takes on light, takes on shadow, takes on definitions in such a way. And this division um, from as far ago as Leonardo, from his um, differentiation of perspective of form and color and substance down to the way we're working in the 20th century is in accordance. It's, it's a direct continuation of that development. And in some way, um, you can almost argue that uh, technique has been driven by certain impulse in the culture. So you have two forms to look after two sets of things, two sets of criteria. And um, in Mario Carpo's writing, he, he, he was talking about how uh, vector files are very small. As you all know, vector files are very small. When you do Photoshop, you have to do pixels, and it's like really large files. When you hit when you do uh, 3D Max, when you do Rhino, it's, it's complex geometry, but very small files, because vectors are very efficient in, in carrying data, because they don't have to record substance. They don't have to, to look after like that. And this is how vector works, which um, which you all know. And now I'm, I'm, I'm sort of leaping out into, still with Leonardo uh, da Vinci's um, ideas, because his cen center to his theory is the way we perceive. So in the perspective, it's not what the geometry rules, it's how you as a human being, as your pupils are curved, and, um, and the way that the world around us, the natural vision is curved in some ways. So curve is, should be retained in perspective in some ways. And um, so, so he was talking about how the pupils of the eye on the pyramids are intersected as an equal distance from the visual virtue, which means that the world is not exactly as in this corner is further away than the center point, but then everything is kind of drawing a similar distance back into the observer. And um, and then also this very important thing about lights and shadows. So the curve is not exactly an outline. So the curves in this case, which is differentiation substance and distance, is not the same as the nominal outline, which bears no, um, no weight and, um, and have no real values in any way. Okay, and this, this, this is, um, I want to show this painting first. So, Montagna in the 15th century. And, and look at it very closely. You see that the, the curvature of the horizon and the path and the walls is all follow, following what Damish calls um, the curvilinear perspective, which was invented to com accommodate the pupil and the heavenly sphere as two sets of sphere, two sets of curve. That's part of our perception. And so this kind of exploration is very exciting in the months um, paintings which is strictly rectilinear and strictly projective lines. And, and the same with this, and, and you can relate even the, the formation of the rocks to not to be strictly a geometrical formation, but they may be following or suggesting certain contour. And even the idea of the contour is, is, a, is fairly new at that point. And uh, the idea of the, the eyes following the contours and the distance suggested by curves in this case in the diminishing of, of, um, of the object and the substance. And so you can see 
the um, curvilinear perspective. It can be abruptly interrupted. So something about the way we relate to the picture is um, streaking away or escaping. So in terms of the idea which we'll, we will arrive at um, later, is the escape, that the curves is almost like suggesting or a vehicle, a sign, which the artist or the, the designer um, envisage to escape the curvilinear order. So they use curves purposefully to escape that, um, that framework. And uh, it's, it's something to do with the conceptual leap, which the leap which we we're talking about at the beginning. And um, so this, this um, idea about the, the, the cupola that's above you, and this is an entirely fictitious curve. So the, the, the cupola itself may be, in reality, a very flat plane or very, just very, very slightly curved. But it's suggesting a much bigger cosmic curve above you. And the, 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 the investigation that's gone in to create that is driven by the wish to escape, again, from the strictly geometric order, which the perspectival system has, um, has limited itself or reducing itself to. And, um, and this, it, this was as, er as early as 15th century. So it was at the same time as something which was invented in a linear way now has a curvilinear significance. And, and the way um, the, the body as well as react in a curved form. And uh, so you're not looking at things always from a, um, a horizontal way. But this is the first ever perspective or curvilinear perspective to be constructed on the vertical axis. So the only straight line here is when you stand right in the middle. It goes straight up to the heaven. But every other line that goes from yourself to the cupola is curved. And uh, so it's, um, it's a lot of symbolic um, significance in that. Okay, another form of curve which we're going into the sense of the curve as a motion, which is some, something bordering line substance and um, emotion as in vector. So you have both the vectorial movement, but then at the same time it's shifting substance. And um, this is, um, Leonardo, again, I, I love it returning to him because the way he encompasses all, all three, he's got the, ri the rigorous discipline of, of trying to figure out the geometric and projective rules, but at the same time, he's completely obsessed with the, um, the Lurge and um, the way um, objects in, in substance and the curve is, is their trajectory, but then also the curve is only visible when they start shifting substance around. So wind is not visible. Wind may have curves, but the curves are only made visible when the wind shifts certain dust or leaves. And so it's, it's the kind of the, the secondary object or, or substance that you insert that reveals the motion, that reveals the, the curve in that way. And this is, this is his painting of the invisible force that's being visualized through a systematic way. And this, this um, this invisible force is uh, taking apart towns and taking apart clouds and taking apart um, substantial forms. But in itself, it, it finds a visual form. Um, and this, this is a very important quote, um, it's particularly the last sentence, that it's not the motion of the wind, but only the motion of the things carried along by it, which is seen in the air. So he's never dealing with an abstracted empty space where there's abstracted an empty vector that's recording the motion. For him, it's only interesting when the vector starts to carry substance. So he's again in between vector and raster. So if he draws a picture in digital form, he's not going to be happy with just the vectorial model. He's just, he, he will combine the two. Maybe there's a rendering mechanism involved that he can both record the geometrical shape of the motion, but at the same time, there's resistance. There's uh, materiality, there's heaviness, there's lightness, et cetera. And it's all being combined in the same file if you were to create a digital file. <laughs> and, um, and in some way, many, many designers nowadays are creating something very similar, something that's in between the empty Cartesian um, substance-less space and the absolutely matter kind of material-driven and uh, emergence from that, that kind of way. And this is the combination of the two. Okay, and um, 
So curves as a form of representation. So it's, um, this is kind of a cross between curves, using curve as an idea of escaping the linear. But uh, I want to use um, um, Murray's flight study, which was in the, the, the end of the 19th century, as a starting point. So he was studying how animals were, how animals fly. And at the beginning, people just thought wings flap, kind of up and down, up and down, in kind of a dual direction way. But very quickly, he discovered by his photographic technique that wings actually work in a figure of eight way. So it's not um, a, a straightforward rectilinear motion. It's becoming a curvilinear motion in that way. And he was, uh, he was quite amazing in discovering how insect flies different to, to, um, to birds. Because insects do pretty much that and is using the uh, air movement to, to create the air. Whereas the birds only use force when they go down. And the upper movement is entirely um, kind of frictionless or energyless because it's the air that, that makes the wind goes up. Um, and so the, I want to show the, the next one first. Okay, so this, so he's making this kind of really, really quick snapshot. So photography is uh, kind of, he's inventing a lot of instruments to do so. But he decided not to say, okay, I'm going to have kind of a moving image, um, which he did. But what he made the most effort at is actually making these photograph into a photo diagram. <coughs> so actually making photographic, you're almost inventing things to make the kind of, uh, there are gaps between the frames, of course. And he even said that it's not perfect because maybe the starting motion of something is in between two shots, so you can't capture it. But if you put it in a diagram like that, which he perfected, he was claiming that this is the perfect observation of the flight of the motion. So he's re relying on the representation or a graphical tool. So curve is like a graphical tool to represent the perfect ideal motion of flight, uh, which he felt photography hasn't got there yet. And uh, so that's why he's making loads of effort to put layers of photography together in order that they appear as if they're falling into that continuous curve. And um, yeah, this, this idea about the discontinuity of the phases, uh, which he, he, he recognizes. But then by the graphical means of making a con continuous curve, he's justifying that um, the flight is as such. And um, so, and, and the way he was studying smoke as well. And it's, it's, um, it's a very, very strong di diagram effort or graphical effort. In, uh, in making a, a perfect representation of a um, curve um, to explain flight. Okay, this is also an interesting discovery. Um, and the, the way curves in the diagram mode also can explain what goes on inside in psycho, uh, psychoanalytical terms. And, um, and my theme is, is something Lacan used very later on to to explain the reason why he used these kind of diagrams, which is very simple, very mathematical in a way. Um, it has its own kind of geometry and, and spatial um, simulation to somehow explain the unexplainable, because he's very conscious of the way words get tangled up. And uh, something I just cannot be explained by uh, the, the literal um, uh, use of words or sentences. And then he felt this is supplementary to what cannot be explained in, in through words. So this is an example of, um, um, yeah, th he didn't use the word curve so much. The word curve actually comes in, into the diagram that he uses. So lots of diagrams he, 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 he created actually on the blackboard is uh, associated with, um, with the use of curve. And, and, and actually one of the um, um, uh, commentators on, on, on the diagram said, well, this is, this is like a vector. Actually, Lacan was fully aware of the fact that this, this is an arrow that represents motion and is penetrating something and come back into something. So the return um, of the partial drive can only be represented by a curve. Okay, and um, so this constructible geometry is um, in the same time of the 1960s. So again, where Adorno was writing about these things, where 
in the early 70s, there's the discursive emerging. So this, this thing about things working loops rather than straight lines start to emerge. But then all these things is, is coming from you know, a long time of things that can be constructed. You get thick books still published in the 60s to try to explain to you how to construct all of these. You can sit at home and construct all, all of these curves. And th there are even like the later ones saying, oh, you can even invent new curves based on the same rules. So this whole idea about constructible geometry, uh, which encompasses curves, um, goes back to the vector graphics. And none of these things ca carry any substance. So um, um, <coughs> uh, this, this kind of abstracted lines, that's both lines and both <coughs> curves, uh, can, can be any shape, can be any scale. And, uh, and this is very different to the image of substance, um, which um, Damage was talking about. Next slide, please. Oh yeah, this sorry about the slides, but this should be earlier. This explains the uh, the outline being more um, being less powerful than color and being less powerful than substance. Okay, right. So um, returning to Mario Carpo's study about how technology influences the, the the concept of design, and this idea by exact copy is. Um, is fundamental to vector graphics. And um, the way that we are relating sameness, so when the object can be copied, either you at home or someone in the office or someone in the construction industry will receive the same file, and the same file can be copied in different scales and in different substances. And that's what makes it very powerful as a design tool. And uh, so even Mar um, Alberti will be talking about, oh, it's, it's so amazing, like the design, even nature herself has been suppressed because then we, we can have two identical noses. It's that kind of excitement that something, you know, a person or a sculpture can be copied, a building as well, from paper to realization. It's also an exact copy in that way. And um, this is a very well-known diagram of, of um, the copying of, of the curves. So how do you copy curves? And then this relates also to the idea of pixel. So there's this big study about how Alberti already knows about pixel, how, how he o also knows about you know, media labs and stuff, how digital design works, and how coordinates correspond from one point to another, and it's scalable in that, in that way. He's already um, quite advanced in, in, in the basic concept of it. And the only difference is speed. So whatever he was doing then, it's being speeded up like millions of times. And therefore, making exact copies is um, um, it's even more easy, and you can have more complex geometry re re um, relating to it. And, um, and the following two are, again, curves as ideas. So this thing about, you know, the world is not really a straight line, or we are not really a straight line. And, um, the way even the, the field of study and this whole thing about the discursive is, um, I mean, Foucault is, is a very powerful figure in addressing that. And I just want to draw your attention to um, Edward Said's uh, small article on Michel Foucault as intellectual imagination in the, in the early 70s and, um, and relating it to the event. So the eruption, um, the event, the leap is, is embedded in the imagination of the curve. So the curve is the return, and also the curve is something discontinuous. It only happens when it happens. It's the utterance when it happens. And, um, and then the, the curve becomes one event linking to another, not straight line. There's no certainty in that, but the event is, um, is something that is beyond the, um, the predicament or the in indeterminacy of that. So um, the, the last sentence about the Intransigent aleatory character. Aleatory is, is uh, the chance, the randomness of the event. So again, the imagination of the curve, the use of the curve. So if you present a curve, it means that you're suggesting something is also event rather than a form. You're suggesting something that it just erupts and, and transforms rather than something that's fixed. So by the, I, I've, um, the way the 60s and 70s is shifting the understanding of the curve is um, it's quite fundamental. So the antithesis to rationality. Um, so you use curve to make a point. You, you make a statement. You, you, um, you're 
reacting to something which may have been uh, infiltrating the, the, the rationality of the thinking system, but also the representational system. And, um, and to the extent of having these, um, the idea of the crooked line, whereas no, if there's an obstacle, you don't have a straight line. We're all obstacles to each other. So therefore, um, you use the curve as um, something relating to the inside. So this is 1927 when um, Kilder was um, a, um, kind of a, a scientist working with psychology. And, but then he was going out and surveying. And he took two shapes and, um, and then two names. One, one name is called um, Takete, one is called Maluma. And, uh, but then he said, he asked the people, so which name associated with which, cha which shape? And, um, and almost 80%, 70% to 80% of the people will say, well, Maluma associates with the curve and Takete associated with the angular shape. And, uh, and so this was a, um, a discovery like, well, in terms of psychology, the, the way the shape itself is not a universal thing, but it's actually relating to how we perceive it. It's also relating to the sound of the language. So Maluma and Takete, it sounds it resonates differently on the inside. And then, you know, this, this is an expressive curve which cannot be copied. And this, this is, is, is a, a direct antithesis to um, a representational form that's relating to right because there, there is space, but it's not, not a, a linear perspective space. There's um, the lines, it's not exactly a, diagram, a diagrammatic line. And this figure of eight um, has gone a long way now in, into something that's expressing um, a, a lot of the unknowns, I dare say. Okay, and um, the idea of the fold. Um, curves as fold, which is interesting because <coughs> they're not the same. Um, and somehow the <coughs> fold is trying, is starting off as, as a philosophical inquiry into mathematics, and then it gets borrowed into the design language. Um, but the fold is borrowing curve as its, its mechanism, as its instruments. Um, so fold at the start is, a, is an idea, it's a notion, it's, it's an approach. But curves kind of help help it along to, to make it happen. And um, so this, this idea about the, the fold as in, I just want to show you something. So there's a curve shape of some sort or any shape, it could be my skin or something. And how do I know how the curve changes across my skin or across the building? And um, Leibniz um, was working on mathematics to say how, we, how can we give, um, how, how can we understand these, these points that's actually deflecting in different ways across the surface? And um, the, the, the idea about it's not points, you cannot actually call them points anymore. They're actually infinite folds. So each point is relating to another point, not a separate entity, but as a continuous motion and continuous energy. So the, the bending moment, um, which you can see here, this is a force diagram, is actually becoming um, a form. So the force is becoming form and there's no differentiate between the two. And, uh, and that became a very powerful um, design tool since the, the, the late 80s, actually. And this idea about the, the you see, so this is kind of an X-ray uh, force diagram that talks about force as continuous, so there's no longer 90-degree um, angles or any kind of angular connection, but everything can be softened into a continuum. And um, this is taking, in, taking us kind of forward into, into the last bit where I'm going to talk about what's happening now, let's say towards the, the end of the 20th century and the early 21st century. With, with curve, how, how, it, how is the, the role of the curve in, in our imagination or in, in, um, in as instruments or as weapons in some ways? And algorithm and, and, and chaos is something which um, undermines what I would say the death of certain curves. And um, so everything's curvy. In, in a way, we were, we're entering a century that everything is not really settled into lines anymore. 
everything, even even the panel can be can be curved in in a nano scale sense. And um, and this the, the KL series starting in the middle of the 20th century about the scaling. So so the curve is a continuous thing. And oh yeah, that's actually working. This was a shape invented in 1906. It's called the cock curve. There's nothing really curvy about it because it's all constructed out of straight lines. But the idea is that this, the notion of the mathematical curve enables the scaling factor of something that can infinitely grow. So um, a Mandelbrot set or, or cock curve is infinitely long. And, uh, and you can zoom in any scale and it will produce the same, um, the same curve. So the curve, um, rather than a, it's no longer a motion, it's no longer a form, but now it's becoming like a continuum tool where um, man can relate to the physical environment um, in such a way. What does it mean to have curves like that? If you're moving from something that's repetitive and um, theoretical continual to something that seemed to become random. And between here and here is the, um, the advancement algorithm. An algorithm as little parcels of instructions that you give to little points. So either it's a fold or it's, it's a continuous inflection. And, um, and the instructions are so minute and the factors that you can bring in is so vast that it can react or respond and interact with each other in a seemingly random way. But it's all, it's all constructed within the framework of coding. And variable transformation became very key to the way curves are work. So you, no lo you can no longer fix. It's not like a leap, no more. It's not like the curvature of the pupils or, or, or the, the, the cosmos, which is, which is like that. But it becomes kind of a growing thing or variable thing. So curve naturally will lead you to, to this. And, and, and I want to discuss a little bit about scripting because this is being used extensively um, as part of the algorithm. But what's interesting to me is the way there's a code frame and there's always a picture frame. So in some way, it's not the sense that Design is inevitably all about coding. Like the whole point about learning about architecture now is, is the mastering coding or collector of coding or mixer of coding. But it's, it's the corner, it's, it's where the pictorial comes back in again. And, um, and this whole idea about, oh, it's really amazing that you can just change the factor. So you, you get these sort of blue, um, uh, numbers where you can change, and each time you change those blue number, which is like very little chunks of a very very long script, and um, and then you get very very different growth and very different time and durations of growth, and and, and in in all sorts of ways that you can you can program it, and um, and this idea of what a lot of arguments about emergence is actually being structured within the framework between the code and the picture. Because the design wouldn't have that imminence if the picture didn't make sense. And then we're still referring back to how the picture talks to each other and talks to us as, as a communicatable means or something which I dare say is, is an anthropomorphic imagination. So the fact that there is um, a coding frame and then there's a picture frame, meaning that the picture frame allows the coding to take on what we can imagine as imaginable or readable or understandable. And, um, and, and also, this, this is quite, quite important because alg algorithm is everywhere now. There, there's uh, lectures on the TED talking about it, how it's changing our world. And, uh, but again, what's curious for me is, OK, so this, there's no need for the sound. Okay, so 
there are algorithms that's, that's controlling stock exchange, controlling the way you choose videos on the internet, controlling Amazon, you know, controlling a lot of things, making decisions on our behalf. But then there are companies out there that are actually trying to capture an image of it. Like what, what is going on? Capturing the image of it. And then there are companies that's coming up with, um, like that is the knife, and that is the carnival, that is the Boston Shuffler, and that is the Twilight, okay? And, um, and giving it names, it's almost like you, um, this, this is a very good talk actually, it's very short. Um, giving it names, giving a name, naming something, pick, to, to make it into a picture, actually allows something that's unreadable, undecipherable, meaningless, bunch of data, millions and millions, billions of data, to become something that can be articulated, can be exchanged. So this becomes a, a tool that the programmers could exchange, but also for common people to say, okay, what does the knife do? So knife is an algorithm that makes stock goes sharply up or, or down, or makes uh, certain kind of uh, favorable books to go up, go up and down, etc. information being transmitted in different ways. And there's still a need to make the coding, the scripting, the kind of vectorial um, um, abstract language into something that we can associate as a representation in, in through pictorial form. And, um, and that's quite a crucial, um, I think quite a powerful thing why scripting is, um, is transforming the design. So you have, um, very exper uh, experimental thing going on, but at the same time, you see it's not an empty thing. It's sort of being slightly rendered, it's slightly rendered in terms of light and shade, in terms of substance, and, um, and the variable design. Pixels and swarm, that's the last bit. And, um, and I want to show you a very short video of something that happened earlier on this year. It's called the brick swarm. And um, it's just like um, about a minute of this. So there are these architects um, working with tiny little machines that can fly. And what they do is that they lift um, big pixelated blocks. So these are phone blocks that they pick up. And the whole investigation is about the um, the operation of how it, it forms a certain, a certain curve and um, how it can be flexible. So the next time you construct the same thing, you, you change the algorithm and, um, and out comes a different, different form. And, um, and they're inventing new, uh, new explanation. So there's the, uh, the blueprint, the operational information, the foreman, which is a software that organizes all the construction aspect and how you fly, how, um, how the weight of the substance changes the way you fly and the speed. And there's the crew, which is what all the little machines is doing. And there's the configuration. Um, so this is a, a different language of, um, of design. So this is the last bit where these two things are operating along the same principle. So the brick swarm, about the blueprint, the form, and the crew, and the configuration, is exactly that impulse to make images of an algorithm which is no longer readable, but it's, it's uh, determining the curves that's uh, in, in our lives. So um, the final thing I wanted to add is, um, is what I call the longing of the digital, actually to be able to make something completely uncopyable, unpredictable, and indeterminate in some ways. And I think that's an impulse that's, um, that's arguably very powerful. And, um, and then there's, there's a relationship which you still have between the abstract space and the pictorial fixation, or the pictorial realization um, that's still interacting with each other um, in, in many ways. So I'll end here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm
I'm happy to answer any questions or comments. Mm. Uh, and I think from the beginning it seems like you're talking about uh, the sort of linearity, the Euclidean line linearity is somehow distinguishable from curvilinearity in the sense that there's a kind of set, an essence of unknowability of something divine, something heavenly. I mean, if one thinks of Copernicus and uh, you know, all the sort of heavenly motions, uh, God is defined as a sphere whose center is everywhere and circumference nowhere. Uh, and, and you project that forward till today where we have these algorithms which are also unknowable and you sort of press play and watch almost as it were nature unfolding and you, you sort of tinker with numbers and, and see how that creates different natures. I mean, is there this sense that we're still sort of playing with this sphere of unknowability in a way, or this kind of, a new, a new essence of nature is emerging out of the digital in a way, uh, I don't know. The, um, that, that's a really, really interesting question and um, that's something, I, I don't think I have a direct answer to, but I have the inclination to, to think that the impulse remains, as in the, um, this, the algorithm, is it something that we have constructed, therefore we have a control of? You know, okay, despite it's only very few people that, that have constructed it, but to this date, actually, the people who are constructing algorithm, they have um, basically relinquished control in a sense that they have to respect the fact that maybe mathematics, in some ways, reflecting what nature is doing, has just certain unknowns. And what they do is that they let it run and then they place a stop button. <laughs> and there's, there's a lot of this kind of uh, uh, anecdotal kind of comparison between people start panicking. It's like, oh, there's, there's no, no numbers anymore. It's like, I, I, I can't enter the data. Where do I enter the data? Um, which is, used to be the case for the, the bacteria, the simple ve vector um, waiting for instructions, where algorithms don't wait for instructions. It's kind of, it runs and runs. And what you do is you poke at it to insert different factors. And then when they start running to a certain point, and then there's this, this this joke about the enormous red button called stop. And then you press it, and then that's it. That, that's the only way to control it. There's no other, and there's no, um, they, 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 they can't anticipate what will come out of it. There's even um, stories about uh, in stock shares, shares just disappear, like you know, up to 9% of the whole entire share just disappearing. And um, so that, I've, that I don't know. You see, that, that I think the longing and the, the wanting to escape but they're also trying to control. It's, it's, it's the same, but it's just we're doing it by a different medium in that way. I d I d um, how, many, how many of you are like expert at algorithm? Perhaps you have very interesting views. <laughs> That's a lie. Um, this is not a fully formed question, but it maybe this follows on what you were talking about. I'm wondering, from the designer standpoint, Maybe this is actually the same question backwards or something like that. But anyhow, from the designer standpoint, is it that they're actually trying to, uh, I guess in, in Ross's terms, like witness nature unfolding? Or is it only to find like the most accurate representation? You know what I mean? I mean, it, this is almost like a, like a kind of a, uh, existential question of, of um, what do you mean by accurate? Is there something like in true? Uh, Are you like I'm about thinking. I guess my reference point is more like uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh -huh. So in artificial intelligence, the goal is to make essentially mechanical systems or electronic systems respond as if they were organic systems, right? Mm -hmm. But and so, in, and to reach a point of complexity in which they can achieve almost like error, which is impossible. Um, you know, that's like that's a trait of a of a of a yeah. of an organic substance, yeah. right? Yeah. So, in design, to use to use algorithms, to use um, uh, almost the aesthetics of artificial intelligence, um, is the goal to create a representation which is most lifelike. Or is it to actually, or, I mean, in the way that you're talking about it, it seems like it's almost to 
Like there's this, there's this assumption that the algorithms are actually natural. Um, there seemed to be an assumption that algorithms are natural, but it didn't start from nowhere. It started mm. from a very, very artificial uh, starting point. And, um, and I think maybe that's not exactly answering your question, but I just want to make the point of this, this it's an urgency, almost at different historical period to say, what does it look like? What does accuracy look like? What does artificial intelligence look like? What does algorithm look like? There's this kind of need for us to, to in order to grasp something, we need a, a kind of a representation or some kind of um, um, describable or decipherable or, or divisible thing. And, um, and then that, in turn, influences the imagination of it. So what is artificial intelligence is pretty much based on how we have represented it so far. But then what it will lead to, we still don't know. We still have to find that question. So how can it be represented? So the, in terms of accuracy, there's, it falls apart. It, it, it's almost it's, uh, it's not really an answerable um, position. Um, but, um, but I think there's the, the deeper desire. It's not, I'm not answering in a technical sense, but like more like the anthropomorphic sense. In, um, in the search of the original, I think that's, that's still kind of quite deep. Like what, what would be the original shape or what would be the original line or um, something that cannot, because if, it's, if it cannot be copied, that means that's it. There's no more of it. But if it's copyable, that means there will be lots of it. So you, dis, you kind of dismantle the, the values of the original entirely. I mean, there's, there's lots of uh, literature on that, beautiful literature on that. But then there's still this longing to say, but there's still something. Maybe that's not copyable. That's just it. That's it. It happens, and it's gone, and that's it. Well, um, yeah, yeah, that seems to be the interesting aspect of, of this kind of area of research is that vitalism and a kind of metaphysical hmm. aspect is always kind of creeping in at the edges. Like, it's always on the horizon is this kind of, like what yeah. Ross said, the unknowability. Yeah. You're yeah. using, like, extremely, I mean, I guess, I mean, you, you mentioned, like, I think in one of the slides you were saying, uh, anti-rational or was it irrational? The uh, antithesis to the rationality. Antithesis to the rational, yeah. but essentially it's like building extremely complex rational systems to reach a kind of irrational, a point of irrationality. Yeah. Okay. Well. That's, that's a very nice um, description for algorithm. For me that makes sense. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> Brian? Trying to uh, grapple with the relation between the repeatable and the copyable. Um, so I'm not trying to. Inside uh, um, a line which is curving at an even and consistent rate, for instance, a, a circular line, um, the rate of change does not change. It's a, it seems as if in pursuit of the uncopyable, you're looking for something like the unrepeatable, which would be a line whose rate of change is consistently itself changing. Um, and so therefore there's, 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 there's never any repetition. There's, that, there's, that, there's never, ev every change is a new event, something like that. Can you still call it a line? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I assume, assume that the, the the trace of those events would be the line. I mean, I'm thinking as a, mm. um, I mean, it's, I mean, a, a sort of absolute curve um, w would be one that is, is simply never ever going to repeat it, it, its direction from, from moment to moment. Is, is that one of them? Yeah. But that's a kind of, uh, I mean, it's like a, a line that uh, is, 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 is not never going to repeat it, its path. Yeah. Or indeed a surface, because if... Um, that's the... Um, I think that that's a significant difference. I think that that's where I call the escape is the realization that the, um, the repeatable uh, system, the perfect circle, the triangle, the primary geometries, 
um, which is the basis of um, factorial design and um, is does not answer to, to, to the wish for um, the surprise. It, it, it's something that justifies itself in, in many ways. It's, it's sort of almost dependent on it being referencing its own rules because it doesn't change, so it doesn't need to refer to anything new. So all the parameters are there, and then it just grows. So you have the textbook on how to do curves, and you can do millions of curves, and that explains it. And uh, whereas exactly what you say, if it's a line, that every point that the, I shouldn't even be using the word point, like where it's leading to as the next trace, if it's traceable, um, is, is a question now. And, um, and something that you may call it a trace um, could have very, very surprising results. It could even be disrupted and emerging somewhere else. And um, that, that I think it's, there's kind of a deep imagination in that, and there are certain kind of um, representing images that enables that, that impulse to be registered and, impo in, in, and that impulse to, to be spreading and to be convincing in that way. So I, I don't know, maybe that, that's life. It's a bit like trying to get a line that's not about geometry, but it's a line about life. <laughs> and and that, that's, you know, when you look at how algorithm is being discussed, in designers, they all you know, start picking on things about organicism or go about emergence and self-order and this intelligence that's linking, okay, the line is like a person, I can decide to, to take left and right. So it's breaking away from pattern language, which um, is a very strong point of the 20th century um, discourses. So uh, out goes like um, things that you can use diagrams to, to, to describe because you can't make diagrams out of algorithm any longer. Um, it's, it's something that's almost like its own different domain in that way. Yeah? One more. Uh, the, the nature of algorithm sort of coming close to mimicking nature or, um, you know, coming close to some complexity that cannot be copied is fascinating. But uh, at the end, <coughs> when when it is actually fabricated or manifested into the physical reality, it's sort of manifested as voxels that are built. Blocks. Blocks. I mean, blocks or voxels are small um, pixels that are sort of three-dimensional in nature. So af after that transition happens, it's still sort of left in the virtual space because uh, nat nature doesn't calculate probably, you know, uh, bit by bit, I mean, even if you increase the resolution of it, it's still somehow left in the digital space, in the virtu virtual space, but it's not completely come into the physical, I, I feel. So you think this, um, the imagination through the BRICS form is still a virtual experiment? It's, um, it cannot be equated as a natural phenomenon? Ki kind of, I mean, because it's still, we can still see the blocks, individual mm -hmm. blocks, I, I, even if you increase the resolution of of the uh, and you know probably it, it can be built in the future by 3d printing or something like that it's still it's still this graininess of the digital field that sort of that you can feel I, f I think I don't know. yeah um, I, I agree I, I agree with you that the um, the brick swarm as an experimentation resides from, um, let's say, it resides in, in, not as in it's just a natural phenomenon, but it, it is part of a virtual trajectory, um, a sort of a virtual imagination that's made real. But then um, it's like the understanding of the vector and the raster is amalgamating. I, I don't think we will no longer need to talk about the two separately because um, the digital technology is taking on both. And in that way, the pixel, is not just a recording of substance. The pixel is also a recording of a vector motion. And therefore, the brick itself somehow has to register its air velocity, its weight, its gravity. So it's, it's like a body. So each pixel is becoming like a body. And um, in some ways, um, um, that, that's right, because you, you're directly asking, so what is 
what is the inter what is the transition now? Is this um, and in my understanding is that the the, the pixel itself is is redefined directly in this kind of experimentation. And they actually imagine it to be directly scalable. So they say each pixel can be as big as a house. So they imagine this huge tower being kind of built by you know, Terminator style helicopters that bring the prefabricated blocks and form this huge tower. So in their imagination, they're, they're thinking vectorially because they're thinking each bit can be scaled up directly. But what happens in reality is that it, it cannot be directly scaled because there are different factors. And you have almost have to recode it or rescript it, redefine it in order that to be scaled up. Because anything to do with matter is not as easily scale, scalable as uh, just a vectorial motion. So um, that that's something that I would, um, I, you know, I'm not very convinced by their their argument that you can can just enlarge like that. Because we can't just enlarge a person. <laughs> I think my question is kind of slightly kind of linked to that. So if you would consider the lower spectral level than that, as we can be speaking. I mean, in a, and I'd like to take some of the arguments uh, to a kind of closer relation to kind of actual design, um, where it seems to me. You know, if traditionally it was said that the arts, including architecture, had a task of mimesis, of the representation of nature, at least within that formulation, there was always some kind of distinction between, well, it was always put in Latin as the difference between natura naturata and natura naturans. Somehow, both the connection, but also the difference between nature as a principle and nature as a kind of visible object which could be imitated. And therefore, the imitation sometimes is more towards one or the other, but the tension is always already there. Actually, I think that was a point of sophistication, in a sense, in traditional classical architecture, which is somewhat lacking in digital, mm -hmm. because you find in respect to these arguments that within digital uh, design, there is a kind of literalism of representation, uh, as if somehow, you know, 10 years ago, blobby architecture followed from pursuing a certain sort of algorithmic kind of design as, as if this was a picture of the new nature. I mean, yeah. which can't possibly be true. That's okay, I've got the mic. Oh, the, um, that's, that, that's really everywhere in the digital discourse at the moment, which is actually very interesting. I find you know, taking that apart to say, okay, they're all interested in becoming light. So that's the ultimate goal, that they want to be as natural. And, and then there's algorithmic camp attacking the parametric camp, saying you're not natural enough, we're more natural than you. Um, and um, they're, the, the way the, um, I think there, there, there should be a shift in the way they place the terms, because they're still placing the terms in describing, let's say, the outcome level, although they're, they're talking about the process. But then, in some ways, like the brick swarm, it's a bit like they, pre they produce a video, and the video is the outcome of the design. And, and then they're placing all these, you know, the video is constructed, you know, fast motion, slow motion, you know, in, in and out. And then they're placing these terms like, oh, it's all very, um, emergent in, in that way, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then they, and actually it's a big argument about matter. They feel matter is something that can be algorithmized, so matter can follow rules that's coming from algorithm, but then when you look at the representation of their outcome, you don't relate it really to any matter. There, there's a still a huge gap between the two. So when I talk about like the rendering technology, rendering and matter is, only bridged by common perception. It's not bridged by any natural or fundamental principle. It's a bit like how we perceive glass 
goes into the rendering of glass, how we perceive trees goes into the rendering of trees, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in some ways, that transition is not something that's just coming from an unknown and superior source. It's coming from very common popular conventional representation of materiality and matter. And uh, in some way, they, 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 they're not addressing that. They're sort of leaping over that saying, you know, now you have the final outcome of our thing, and then it's as natural as ever. So I, that Mark, that, that was a very good point. It's a symptom of the <laughs> digital discourse. Could I just add one more question, in a sense, mm. to, 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 to push you to go a bit further? I mean, whatever, obviously, the problems, and I fully accept them, about projective, the projective as the general kind of description of architecture as a such. I mean, clearly, you developed towards the end of the thesis the notion of introjective architecture, which is happening already on your terms in some sanctuary, uh, in which the renderings are able to play a constitutive role in the design. Um, the problem then, taking up the point you just made about conventional, which is, you know, actually it's not the thing, it's certainly not the nature of the thing, it's actually conventional representation. It would mean that this kind of architecture was really a recipe for recycling convention. Or you could put that another way, is a way of recycling dominant ideology at every level. And that, I think, is the challenge for you to dig into. Far from being <laughs> emancipatory, uh, it threatens to become the, 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 the greatest servant to relations of power, finally, in the sense that we say, well, you know, architecture can't just reflect power, one always says in the lecture, no, no, it's true, it might be. Uh, one last question. Um, in your talk, you, you show the image which you said was unpopular. And then you said in conclusion that the only remark that I did show was the one that was unpopular. Um, could you explain to me that? What, what makes the, the image unpopular? Um, the, are you referring to Sai Tomlin's curve? Yeah. The um, I this this is sort of it's a bit I, I wish I had more of a chance to pick up on because uh, this is actually the link I, I really like to go back to because I feel this this uncopyable mechanism which Sai Tom Lee is is doing. Okay, you can say he's an artist and he does lines that he feels like it. But he's very systematic in testing the lines. He's done a series of these on title paintings based on lines and based on different depths of how he penetrates the surface and different kind of dis uh, um, dissolve um, or blurriness that the, the line is capable of doing. So in some ways, he he's also has a system in itself. He, it's not a random line as in he just feels like doing that today and then tomorrow is something else. That it's, it's, a, it's a very intended kind of test on how the line responds to certain things that he wanted to say. Okay, certain things that's to do with him very, maybe very deep. Um, maybe it's also relating to how people perceive it. So he's very conscious of how the lines is relating to how we feel about perhaps um, certain conventions, perhaps certain everydayness, perhaps certain, because you know, it's, it's a bit like chalk on blackboard, so there's that reference, but then there's also the rain, there's also um, 
the sequence of movement, which you know how how long how how your arm could stretch in that way because you can feel it that just you know standing in front of the cameras you can feel how the arm stretch, and um, so this I, I don't think I can answer your question fully because I haven't worked it out in that way, but I feel the uncopyableness is embedded in things that the digital discourse is is not addressing or or um, what's the word maybe um, I think they're overlooking I think it's not a conscious thing but then they, they there's certain kind of drive that's pushing them to trying to explain the, the nature you know from um, the algorithmic way or from 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 the matter way but there's actually Again, I, I, I like using that word anthropomorphic because it's relating to back to the person, like how we are, how we operate, and, uh, and certain patterns and, and conventions that we also have. And it's that kind of uh, link, which I feel with any means, it, doesn't, it, it could be something else that's making those lines. Um, but it, it, it sort of has to be in dialogue with all these different factors that's actually producing the line itself. And, um, and that's what makes it uncopyable. So it's not a technical issue, and uh, it's not a historical issue, and, but it is an inten intended issue. It's kind of if it's part of the intention or not for it to encompass. Because these, you can, re you, can, you can actually make factors out of these. That's part of the construction of the line, if that's the issue. So yeah. <laughs> I think that I'll stop there because uh, it's to be to be developed. Okay. Well, above all, I would like to thank Jordan uh, for giving this incredibly interesting kind of introduction to the way she's thinking, and I really think her arguments are a genuinely kind of strong and original part of a field which is so swept and gusted. Thank you, Mark. Thank you all.